Hey, it's time for another episode of Hashtag Event Icons, presented by Endless Events. The show where you get to ask the icons of the events industry anything. Just follow us on social media to ask questions. Our iconic guests will answer them live during the entire show. Before we get started, the more people we have watching, the better the conversation. So please help share hashtag event icons on Twitter, Facebook, and LinkedIn. Just tell your friends to watch live on any of our social media channels. Now, without any further delay, this is hashtag event icons. Hi, everyone. I know it's been a minute. It's been, I think, a full month since we've had an event icon. So I'm super excited. We are starting it off with a bang. Um, Our guest today is among the most respected figures in digital media with a 20-year history of leadership in digital media, experiential events, and technology. He has developed integrated digital video strategies for large media companies, including Viacom, Discovery, and Nat Geo, and is the GM of VidCon, which in case you don't already know what it is, it is the world's largest convention for online video creators. So welcome to Event Icons, Jim Lauterbach. Thank you very much. It's great to be here. That is quite the bio. I think that's like the most I've, I've you didn't said. have to read the whole thing, you know. <laughs> no, I, I picked my favorite parts, but no, you have such an extensive background. Um, my my favorite question to ask everyone when they come on event icons is, how did you stumble into the events world? Um, sounds like you have a really extensive background in uh, editorial, and it also says in tech as well. So, how did you get into the events portion of your career? Well, it kind of fell into it a little bit, but um, I was in media and magazines and then the web and television. And um, particularly when I was running PC Magazine, we had this event in New York City called Digital Life that we started. And uh, so I was kind of on the board of that and helped that show happen for a couple of years. I was on the advisory board for CES for a few years as well, running uh, ZDTV and Tech TV, the content there. We actually started the best of CES uh, brought that idea to them in, oh God, 1998 maybe. And, uh, they loved it. So we did the first couple of events, a couple of best to see. Yes. So a little feel for what happens with events, but, uh, didn't really get into actually running events until, uh, I had a company, one of the early YouTube multi-channel networks called revision three from 2007 to 2012, which I sold to discovery, which is how I ended up there left after a couple of years. And I had a non-compete couldn't go back and work in television, but I could work in events. So I'd been um, speaking at and talking to and working with the founders of VidCon. And I reached out to Hank Green, who started as an early YouTube star. And I said, you know, I can't really do television anymore, but I can can do events. Need any help with that event? And he said, yeah, you know, we're going to build our industry track up and launch a creator track. And you want to come in and run that for me? So I was like, yeah, I'm not doing anything else. So that's kind of how I started, like, primarily focusing on producing first a piece of event and now running a whole events business. Wow, that is awesome. Just casually hanging out with <laughs> Hank Green and seeing how I can help. <laughs> exactly. But no, that, that's awesome. And I know a big part, obviously, of 2020 and the pandemic hitting was you and your team pivoting to um, a more virtual experience of VidCon. Can you kind of walk through you know, what that l- first looked like when you and your team found out, okay, the in-person is off the table how do we still make sure that we have this experience for these creators and for these fans? Um, what did that kind of look like when you were planning that switch to the virtual experience? Yeah, so pic- picture this, right? It's a year ago, right? <laughs> exactly a year ago. Isn't it wild? I can't That's believe so that wild. amount of time has passed. I know, it's so wild. We had we had just gotten back from London because we did VidCon in London end of February of 2020. And we started looking at what was going on and you know, we're all working from home and the virus is spreading and we're all starting to freak out. And we kind of came to that realization. It's like, you know what? I don't think we're going to do a U.S. event in June this year. And so, you know, once that shock wore off and once we decided that we weren't going to do it and there was no room to do it in the fall, because at that point, everybody was moving their events to the fall in Anaheim. And we kind of said to ourselves, yeah, I don't think we're going to do that. Um, there's no room in Anaheim anyway to do it the way we want to do it. So we're at the Anaheim Convention Center in the U.S. And so we basically canceled it and said, what are we going to do? I mean, we could do, you know, a virtual version, but it's just going to be three or four days of, you know, nonstop Zoom calls, 80, 90 Zoom calls. And like, no, you know what? Our audience is at home. 
there, you know, we, we have an audience of fans, teens that want to see their creators. We have an audience of creators that want to learn how to make better content. We have an audience of people in the industry that don't know what's going to happen. They need VidCon. So we said, why don't we spend a summer and do VidCon all summer? We'll do 10 to 15 things a week. We'll do, we'll launch a, an online platform, an online community on Discord. And we'll really try and engage people wherever they are. And if they can't come to us to VidCon, we'll do what we can to bring the power of VidCon to them. So thus VidCon now was born. And all summer we did, um, you know, 200 sessions, something like that, but over the course of 13 weeks. That's awesome. Was it a struggle coming up with all of that content and then figuring out how to fill that that time and what that looked like logistically? No, we already, you know, it wasn't hard to do the content because um, we'd already just planned sort of that many sessions for our U.S. event. It's not that we just repeated everything. We did things to lean into what worked in digital, but it wasn't, the hard part was taking a team that was used to doing face-to-face -face events and going to a place and making magic happen, right? Turning them into more, not video producers or television producers, but having them learn how to do events that are digitally delivered, you know, learning how first to run Zoom. And then we started, we moved to another platform, how to send that out, how to promote it, how to market it, how to build it. And the team rose to it. They were amazing. But we basically had to flip everybody around almost, you know, 90 degrees, 180 degrees to do something completely different. And something that, you know, as it turns out, the fans really wanted, and they really wanted it around the world. We, we were amazed by the around the worldness of our attendees. <laughs> yeah, that's fantastic. And, you know, that is a really 180 switch. So now going into, you know, looking into 2021 and this year, what is, what's the plan? Is it a 180 switch back? Is it a 90 switch? Are we doing a whole 360 Macarena? <laughs> what, what does that kind of look like? What was we go into the hybrid and the virtual, you know, kind of blending together? Nice. I like how you got all of the angles of the circle in there. That was good. <laughs> I think it's going to be a 294.37 degree shift this year. No. Um, what, after we did the summer of VidCon now, um, it was so great and so successful. We decided to keep doing it. So we said, look, we love engaging with our audience around the clock. We love reaching people all around the world. I mean, we've got five events that we're planning in different parts of the world, but we were able to reach people in 180 countries. And so it kind of told us there's this hunger for VidCon everywhere. People can't come to VidCon um, because of money or time or distance. They still want that VidCon experience. So this year, the goal is to keep doing the VidCon Now stuff, which we're doing it three, four things a week, not 12. <laughs> but also we're starting to plan what face-to-face -face events will look like at the end of this year. And our goal is to bring all of them back in the second half of this year. So that's what we're working on. Working on both of those things at the same time. Yeah, that's a really exciting, you know, a very positive look forward to the future because I know that that in-person experience, people are still craving that. But, you know, rather than just going fully in person, you don't want to ignore all those people that you identified around the world who are so excited to finally be a part of something like this. Um, so it kind of goes into, I'd love to talk about our topic of, you know, the hybrid models for the future. Um, we have a really large uh, event planning audience. So what, what would you say to some of these planners when, um, you know, they're kind of trying to navigate this, this hybrid experience and uh, it's, it sounds like a lot <laughs> for learning the whole digital side was, uh, you know, a learning curve, but then now marrying that with the in-person can be challenging. So what, how did, how do you kind of come up with these models that you think would work really well? Well, the first thing to do, I think, is look at the people and see who can do what and who will rise up and who has interest in different areas. So for us, you know, we threw everyone at the problem and it was <laughs> kind of like the Harry Potter sorting hat, right? Some people ended up in, you know, Gryffindor. Some people ended up in Slytherin. Um, no, I, I, nobody was in Slytherin, maybe Hufflepuff. But um, once you figure out the people that you have and what they can do, and then also figure out how you need to augment those people, break down the hybrid situation. So it's not just one big scary thing, but it's really kind of three different things. So the first is like what I said we did with VidCon now, which is how are you going to engage your audience when your event isn't happening? And so think about ways to connect with your audience. You don't have to do 12 things a week. You don't even have to do five things a week. Maybe it's 
once a week, maybe it's once a month. Just think about ways to engage your audiences digitally and help them rediscover the joy and the wonder of the concept of your event and what you do and the community that you bring. Then think about the event itself. During the event, you wanna be able to make that event available to people who can't come physically for you know health distance time reasons. And so you don't need to stream all of it. You don't need to just to replicate that live experience digitally, but pull the best pieces together, craft it into something that you think is gonna make sense and make that available digitally for people to connect to, be a part of, and figure out where the intersections are, where you wanna bring the digital version and the face-to-face -face version, IRL and URL together. Mm -hmm. It's not gonna be everywhere. Some things just don't work digitally and they work great at a face-to-face -face event. Some things don't work at a face-to-face -face event, but could work really well digitally. So, and then the third one is after your event, can you capture the essence of some of those sessions, segments, whatever, and then package them up so people who couldn't go to the event weren't there at that time mm -hmm. can watch them and experience them later at their leisure? Interesting. I love that. And I think, yeah, we're almost sometimes trying to fit that round peg in a square hole and it doesn't always work uh, just because, you know, some of these experiences weren't weren't meant for the medium that, you know, we try to sometimes fit them in. So those that's really great pieces of advice to just, you know, focus on the three. They each do something really well, kind of like your team, identifying what works really well and what different department. Same with content, figuring out what works really well. I think that's a great rule of thumb to go by. Um, something the, else that I was, oh, go ahead. Oh, I was going to say, the other thing is to, um, that you remind me as you were saying that is don't be, you know, be open to being surprised about what might work. So for example, we do meet and greets, right? It's one of your favorite creators. You get to sit there in a line and then you get up and you take a selfie with them. You get a hug and you validate the love that you have of, you know, with, of this online creator and that community by taking that picture and then posting it on your socials. I was like, there's no way we're gonna be able to do those meet and greets digitally. It's an entirely different experience. It's, it's impossible. But as it turns out, we went into this great piece of uh, online service app called Chattelize that actually let us do digital meet and greets that actually worked. Now it wasn't, you didn't get a hug with your favorite creator, but you did get a minute conversation with them and you get to snap a selfie and post it. So just because it might not seem like it's going to work, it might. So be ready to be surprised. Oh, I love that. And with that too, I mean, it kind of has to, you know, follow just then. I think a really important part of that is the intent. The intent is that you still have that one-on-one -on -one interaction. And I think that's what people really are drawn to. Um, and also just working at, you know, looking at the intent of, the creators themselves, a lot of them are, you know, born on this digital platform of YouTube. You know, we're so used to having them like in our, you know, computers anyways. So what is the, you know, main difference between, um, you know, just being a normal passer viewer and then someone who gets to have that interaction? That's a really interesting kind of concept that you don't really <laughs> think <laughs> about. Um Another part that I was reading about this uh, experience was that it, you're kind of doing these little mini virtual events um, year round too. So what is what did that kind of decision look like for your team when you decided, okay, rather than having this, you know, in a certain few amount of months, um, what what prompted that year round decision? Well, you know, when we did it over the summer, we realized that people wanted to connect with us year round and that we wanted to connect with them. So we built this great community at each of our events, wherever we do them, and they all come together for that event, and then they all go away, and like, what do they do the other 51 weeks of the year? Well, they still wanna connect with us, they still wanna connect with creators, they still wanna connect with each other. So we built ways for them to do that. Now, um, Discord was a platform that we launched that's a 24 seven persistent community where you can go in and, and there's always someone to chat with there, whether you're a creator or a fan or the industry, but one of the things we realized, um, uh, so we're, we're a B2B event and a fan event. So on the B2B event side, you know, in the summer, people are like, yeah, I'll watch a workshop. I'll watch a fireside chat. But, um, you know, Zoom fatigue got real. <laughs> and even though we don't use Zoom to produce it anymore, that's still that concept of watching and looking in your computer and people had less time for it. And we realized on the industry side, we started going around like, let's find a really important topic 
And rather than doing 30 minutes or 45 minutes on it, let's take one day a month and do two and a half hours on it with a little networking afterwards and really dive in on that topic. And so we've done that uh, on a couple different things. We'll continue to do that. So we do less like industry stuff every week and more like let's do one key big thing a month and bring people together. That is huge. I think that's really kind of, uh, I mean, into my next point too, really thinking about the next generation and, you know, what they expect. Um, I think they're expecting something different and rather than one, you know, high level overview of something, a really deep dive into one specific topic is really exciting. Um, are there any other insights that you have into that next generation and what they're going to kind of expect from these types of events? Well, I think, you know, Two things. One is when, you know, most of us are vaccinated, we go back to real events, we're no longer stuck at home. It's going to be very different. Now, what that looks like, I don't know. But the expectation of, you know, I'm going to attend a virtual event and I'm going to do it for two days might go away. So we've got, we have to really be sensitive to that. And again, I don't know. I don't know anybody who says they know. I don't think they know what they're talking about. <laughs> but you have to react and you have to figure out and try a lot of different things, experiment and figure it out. Now, with that said, and this is something I told the team as we moved from going from face-to-face -face events to virtual events, I said, we're not making television. These YouTube stars and TikTok stars and Instagram stars are gonna be way better at making video than we ever will be. What we're about is kind of the three C's, right? It's about community, so bringing people together, it's about connection, letting people make connections with each other and with content and with creators. And then the final one is content. So lean into all three of those. And by the way, I don't think we've done a great job on the community side. Um, we've tried a lot of things and we keep trying new things and we're getting better at it. But new ways to connect people together, new ways to build and foster community. And then the content is not necessarily third because it's the least important but it's just one of the three pillars you need to build your digital strategy on. I love that. Um, I think the key aspect is something that has touched on almost every single episode we do. Um, yeah. So is, if you could dive into a little bit about that and maybe some of your learnings around what works and what doesn't when building that community online. Sure, a bunch of different things. And um, so we built a Discord community 24 seven persistent thinking we would bring you know, our fans together, that we would bring our, uh, the creators there. We thought that we would bring the industry there. But what I realized is that it's a great platform for that. And I actually think that it, we can expand on it as we move back to face-to-face -face events, but it wasn't necessarily something that a, you know, 40 year old industry exec really understood. I mean, mm -hmm. Discord started with gamers, talk to people in their teens, or their early twenties, they're all over Discord. They're probably there all the time. They've got a bunch of servers that they belong to. And there are some of us geeky types who are older who use Discord as well, but it's still not the point where it's everywhere. Now, I made the decision not to put industry on, say, Slack and everybody else on Discord because I wanted everybody in one place because that's the power of VidCon. Everybody's in one place. You got fans over here and the industry over there and the creators in the middle. But um, in retrospect, probably should have launched it on Slack. So think about your audience and the sorts of experiences on digital that they're used to and maybe try and shape it a little bit to that versus hoping or trying or forcing them into an experience they just might not be ready for. Right. Oh, that's great insight. And just that you experimented. I think that's awesome too, that, you know, you found what works really well, what doesn't. Um, and that's another thing that is, it seems to be a common theme is meeting people where they're at of just, yeah, where is your audience? What, how do they primarily communicate? It's crazy to me that we have all these things that we do gravitate to. Yes, Zoom fatigue is real, but then we have all these things where we would, you know, sit down in front of the TV for two hours for. Um, so just trying to find those things and, you know, building up events around that, um, I think is a really interesting perspective as well, because, you know, that's where people are at and, you know, expecting them to change their behavior um, just for, you know, an event you're producing can be really challenging at times. Well, and also take a look at the things you've been building and what you're learning, and it may not be right in one context, but it could be better in a different context. So for example, you know, we move towards doing AMAs on Discord with creators, that's working out really well. But as we start to go back to doing face-to-face -face events later this year, 
I want to start reinvigorating Discord so that when you buy a ticket, you get invited to a special area of our Discord server where you can come connect with other people that are going as well. So how do we start building that community and that expectation of the event before the event happens and using those online tools to do it? That's awesome. That's a really great way too to kind of tie the two together um, and that hybrid experience and, and blending those a little bit. I know that's a big controversial topic of the in-person experience and the virtual experience are never going to be the same, which is true. They're not the same experience, as you've said, and there's pros and cons to both. But I, I like that where you take that digital experience and kind of transition it into, you know, the, the in-person or vice versa. Um, as you go into planning more of those face-to-face -face events this year, what, what are some things that you and your team are looking at? I know a lot of planners who are probably tuning into this are, you know, it's a big question mark still of what is 2021 going to bring? So what are you and your team looking out for in terms of indicators of what's possible and what we still kind of have to wait around for? Well, I think it's going to move really quickly on one level. Um, and so, you know, when you look at events in general over the last four or five years, particularly the festivals like what we do, you know, we had to react really quickly when, you know, some terrible, awful things happened in the world. And so we built perimeters around our event. We put in metal detectors and bag checks. Uh, and that was a change for us because if you've ever been to the Anaheim Convention Center, it's pretty wide open. Like anybody can stroll over from Disneyland into the convention center. So we had to both create the reality and the, you know, the, the visual indicators of security. So when we go back to doing face-to-face -face events, we're going to have to do the same thing with health and, uh, and welfare, right? So we have to create the reality of a healthy space. And we have to create the visible markers as well. So is it temperature checks? Are we handing out masks to everybody? Do we social distance? All those things, yes. The answer is yes, we will. <laughs> um, but uh, we're still formulating what that plan is. And you know what? Like When we do events, you know, we already announced some of our events this fall. Like For example, we're going to do Abu Dhabi in December. Oh, wow. And I know when we get to Abu Dhabi, it's going to be different than it is now. I hope it's more open and I hope it's, you know, not, um, you know, two meters around each person and, and stuff like that, but we have to plan for that eventuality. So on the sort of health and safety side, that's one of the things we're looking at. Yeah, that's great. I think making sure that attendees feel that safety as much as it is being implemented, I think is a really important thing because it's, it's going to be a weird transition, especially for me, someone who loves music festivals and all of those things the thought of being in a crowd of, you know, thousands of strangers with no masks right now, the idea of it terrifies me. So I think easing attendees back into that experience is so smart. Well, I, I'm a big music festival fan too. So, you know, Jazz Fest in New Orleans, oh, I missed it now two years in a row and all those others. Oh, but no. um, but I, I do think, look, there's, we all have cognitive biases, right? And recency bias is very real. So we mm -hmm. give, we overweight things that happen you know, like that it just happened. And we underweight things that happened a long time ago or have never happened, which is why back in February, when COVID started spreading, we're like, oh man. And then we're like, yeah, this will be a couple months and then we'll be back at events in October. But now that we've been through it for a year, as we start going back doing face-to-face -face stuff and as we, as we tame this tiger, as it were, because the pandemic lockdown will be fresh in our minds, we're going to overweight that. And so even though in reality, you know, by December, that music festival that you want to go to, you'll be, will be vaccinated. It should be fine. You know, not a problem, but in our minds, we still remember that we're, we're locked down yeah. and it's going to be very hard for us to go back to the, that way. Now give it a couple years, just like, you know, like if, if you have a baby ever, um, you know, the, the first six weeks are baby boot camp because you don't get any sleep and, you know, and, and it's like, it's crazy. And then you think, well, you know, if, if, if we really, really remember things the way they were, we'd never have more than one child. But after, <laughs> you know, a year or so, you're like, oh, I don't remember any of that anymore. And he's so cute. Let's have another one. So recency bias is why, you know, why we, we actually have more than one child.
That is a great point. I think diving into the, the, you know, there's a lot of psychology going on. It's a really complex thing. There's so much about, you know, re-entering into socializing. I feel like, you know, conversations like this are a little bit easier for me now. I've been doing this for maybe a year now, but sometimes when I have an in-person conversation, I feel like I'm talking to eighth grade crush or something like things are not coming out right it's weird to you know be back into that in-person experience so I I think that's a really good kind of understanding of why maybe you know we think that the way we think and it'll maybe be our uh, job as event planners to kind of dig into some of those psychological issues that we've had from this last year and help correct them and help ease our attendees minds as well. Totally. Dan, you actually bring up a good point. I didn't even think about this one, but <laughs> I now I'm visualizing myself on my first stage doing a fireside chat or moderating a panel and actually being face to face with people again and being like, that's going to be a little weird. Right? Um, I can't wait, but I'm also now I'm going to be thinking like, what am I really going to be like when I'm up there? Yeah. Will I no, be like on a date when awesome. I was in eighth grade again? <laughs> <laughs> that's the best way I can equate it to is that socialization. I think that's awesome. it's, it's changed so much. It's wild. But um, yeah, as, as we're kind of wrapping up to uh, with, uh, you know, event planners, everything's still being like a really big question mark. And, you know, people who are designed maybe this year round approach. Um, what is something, you know, one tip that you would leave with planners right now and uh, help them navigate through? Yeah, I think the the real thing is just be flexible. Don't commit to anything real. You know, I mean, you've got to commit, like you've got to commit to your convention center. You've got to commit to this. You've got to commit to that. But be flexible because things are going to change really quickly. And the thing that we think is going to work might not work, but something else that somebody else is doing that we look at, we're like, oh, that's really working. So, you know, listen to this podcast, listen to others, read, see what other people are doing. and you know, borrow what they're doing, network with people who are in the event business. Cause I learned so much just from talking to people who are facing the same problems we are and doing the same things. And I've learned and and tried things because somebody else like, yeah, I tried this. It worked. I'm like, well, that's really cool. I never would have thought about that, but let's give it a try. So sometimes, and I think, you know, we all may have got caught in those ruts of like, we know how to do our event. We know how to do this. It's done. It's done. It's like, no, it's all different now. But even when it goes back to being normal, it's going to be different. So Learn, listen, watch, try, and, you know, don't be afraid to make mistakes because the audience will be forgiving. They want to come back to see us. They want the experiences that we build. So as long as we adapt to that and try different things, it's going to be great. I mean, maybe, you know, this year is going to be fine. It's going to be good. Man, 2022, 2023, (laughs) I think they'll be calling it the Roaring Twenties once again. I agree. And I love everything you said about learning, you know, talking to people, definitely connecting with people. Um, it's a good come network with you. If they will hear more about you and what you and your team are doing, where can they find you? Sure. So uh, on LinkedIn, uh, I'm just uh, uh, Jim Lauderback. Look me up. Uh, J-L-O-U-D-E-R-B is pretty much my username everywhere. So that's where you can find me on like YouTube and Twitter and other places. But yeah, spend most of my time on LinkedIn. Uh, and you can come and hang out. I have a newsletter that I um, do every week about inside the creator economy, which you can read on LinkedIn, but you can also subscribe uh, by going to the VidCon site. So, you know, reach out. I love to talk to people about event stuff. So thank you so much for having me on, Sarah. Awesome. Thank you, Jim. And thank you, everyone who tuned in. We had a few viewers come in and out. It was awesome to see. So thank you, everyone. For those of you who are not subscribed, make sure you go do so at www.event-icons.com so you don't miss any more of these awesome um, live chats that we're having, but also all of our on-demand content uh, you can find there as well. So we'll have this one with Jim and all of his awesome resources as well. So you guys can go check that out. But Jim, thank you so much for joining me today. This was an awesome conversation. And I think everyone who tuned in definitely got something from it. So we appreciate it. Cool. Thanks, Sarah. And thanks for doing these things. I think it's really important that all these different views get out there. So I think it's awesome. So thank you. Definitely. We'll have to have you back on sometime. (laughs) Anytime. See ya. Bye, everyone. Thank you for joining us for another amazing episode of Hashtag Event Icons. To catch all of the bonus content, resources mentioned, and an invite to our Facebook and LinkedIn groups, 
head to www.event-icons.com. Also, let us know what you thought about this week's episode. Share your biggest takeaway. And just tag your social media posts with hashtag event icons. We'd love to hear from you. Thank you for joining us. We'll see you again soon right here on hashtag event icons.